I'd like to introduce you to our very special guest today, Mr. Jim Coulter. Jim is the founding partner and executive chairman of TPG, a global alternative asset management firm with approximately $137 billion in assets under management. Jim has been a member of the board of directors and a controlling stockholder of TPG since its formation in 1992. He is known for um, having led some of the largest transactions in North America and previously served on the boards of numerous public companies such as Continental Airlines, Northwest Airlines, Lenovo Group, J. Crew, Oxford Health, and, and of course the boards of various other private companies as well as academic and charitable institutions. Uh, Jim graduated from Dartmouth College, summa cum laude, and, and received his MBA from Stanford where he was named the R.J. Miller Scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure and honor to welcome the one and only uh, Jim Coulter. Good morning, Mo. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Jim, thank you for joining us. It's uh, morning on the West Coast, noon on the on the East, and uh, really delighted to have you. We got a lot to talk about today. Um, and maybe just to start, I'll set the stage because I'd love for us to cover at least four things. So number one, I'd love to hear about your unique background and the origins of TPG. I'd love for us to talk about your observations from being in private markets for the last 30 years. Number three, I'd love to get your insights on those private markets, how they've evolved and how we as investors should think about it. And finally, I'd love to hear your thoughts on which market strategies or opportunities or ideas are most interesting for you today. Uh, are you good with that? If we cover those four no. things? All right. So, okay, so let's let's start at the beginning. Um, you know, starting with your personal background, I understand your most formative years, you were growing up on a farm, right? How did that shape you and perhaps even prepare you for the high calling of private equity? Well, I grew up uh, most of my summers, until I was 22, the only job I really had uh, full time was working on the family truck farm in Western New York. In fact, if I climbed the hill behind our family farm, I'd look across and see the CN Tower off in the <laughs> distance, kind of a Canadian Oz that uh, I could aspire to. Uh, and it was a great way to grow up because uh, I learned, I think, two things that still stick with me. First of all, uh, it was hard work uh, and uh, nothing since then has really uh, uh, in any way ruffled me in terms of hard work. And the second is, I um, you know, farming is something that doesn't just happen. You have to spend a long time before something blooms, germinates, and, and is harvested. And yeah. in some ways, that uh, prepared me for the patience that is private equity. <laughs> and what would be, since your days of farming to the days you entered private equity, what was the most interesting job you may have had in between? It's a, uh, it's a good question. It's a question I often use in interviews. You learn a lot about people if you ask them what their strangest uh, job was. And Mo, I'll, I'll get that from you sometime. But I think maybe one of my most formative jobs is for four years, uh, I spent about a month selling Christmas trees in an outside lot in Buffalo, New York. And uh, it was a fascinating experience because the person I worked for refused to put prices on the trees. Instead, I was supposed to figure out how much to ask. Mm -hmm. and it was an interesting inventory management issue because those trees weren't worth much on December 26th. Um, so first of all, how do you size people up? You got to watch what car they drive in, what shoes they have on. And secondly, my career has been a exercise in group decision-making. If you want to see interesting group decision-making, watch a family buy a Christmas tree. You learn a lot about who's really in charge and you learn a lot about how decisions are made. So, you know, I often, uh, I often think back to those days and, and many of those skills stuck with me. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to ask who's in charge in your home, but I do want to <laughs> talk a little bit about how you went from there. So you went from there, uh, you got into private equity, and eventually I know you were working for the Bass family. And then you set out to go on your own to do something different, to start TPG. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about how you went from the Bass family to TPG? And what was it that was so unique and different that you were looking to establish with the firm? Yeah, after university, I, I went to New York for a couple of years and so I got exposed to finance. But when I came out of business school, I made a, a bit of an odd choice. I took by far the lowest paying job. I was offered to work for a Texas family, the Basses. And the early days of alternative investing, if you kind of go back to the mid 80s, 
it was a few families, the Basses, the Pritzkers, and a few very small firms, Forsman, Little, KKR, Warwick, Pincus. And the right. firms and the families were neck and neck. And so uh, in the early days, really, of what became private equity, um, I was coming from the family side of the business. And in some ways, you know, you're all uh, you're all a product of your roots. That experience in a family investing environment shaped who we are as a firm. That was kind of mm -hmm. probably decision number one. And decision number two is when we started the firm, I thought there was a bit of a group think going on in New York where essentially everyone in the business was coming from the transactional side of the business. They were all Wall Street people. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to be that. We were coming from a different place. So we set up on the West Coast. So those two decisions, you know, building it in the in the the uh, aftermath of a family investing experience and building on the West Coast still shape TPG today. Hmm. Um, and I, we're going to get into TPG a little bit more in a few minutes. But I do want to turn to, you know, you've now been in this game for some 30 years. You've had some observations, some learnings. So what would you, what are some of the things that you would tell someone who's just walking into private equity today? Like, for example, if I said to you, I have a billion dollars of fresh powder to deploy, and which is a real scenario for a number of families, what should I be thinking about as I, go, as I uh, embark on that journey? Let me address that in two ways, because there, um, there's two important questions. Like, what is private equity? It's something that is um, less well understood than it should be. Mm -hmm. And then the second question of, all right, if you're coming into the game today as a family, how do you think about it? First of all, let's let's get straight on what it is. Um, my best definition for private equity is it's simply an investor with a different toolbox. Mm -hmm. If you think about public market investing, where I actually started my career, you have very limited information and your tool is you can buy a stock or you can sell a stock. Maybe you mm -hmm. can short it or you can put some collars on, et cetera, but really a very limited toolbox. When I jumped over to private equity, I was shocked at the number of tools that we have. We have complete information. We ask companies any questions, they actually answer them though. Like in public market, there's this kabuki of what are you doing next quarter? I can ask a company for its five-year projections and take them apart. And once we invest in the company, we simply don't vote our proxy. We actually control the boards. We bring in new management teams. We change the strategies. We can uh, do acquisitions to add value. So you start with investing. You have to invest in the right company at the right time. But then we have an enormous number of tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, people ask why private equity is much of people's surprise in some cases overperformed for 30 years. No one should be surprised. If you have smart people and you give them the right tools, it would be surprising if we didn't overperform. So if you right. think about private equity, it starts with being an investor, but then you have to very much focus on what tools you have and how you continually sharpen them. Hmm. Um, so if the other things I'd see, think people potentially get wrong if your family's thinking about doing this, it is a team sport. Uh, you know, stock picking an individual uh, you know, you, you hear a lot about Warren Buffett. You don't hear that much about his team because he's making a few decisions. When we make that decision, that's our job just beginning. Yeah. So, uh, understand the team dynamics. It's an ecosystem. It's not just a firm. Uh, if you gave me the same thousand people who are TPG and I started anew, it would take me 20 years to build to where we are. Mm -hmm. just to give an example, Mo, you know, we recently did a very successful deal that deal came to us because a CEO I worked with 20 years before picked up the phone and said, you know, you're the right person for this, Jim. And, uh, you know, a billion dollars later, here we are. Uh, but that was a 30 year ecosystem that was built. <laughs> so it's a team sport. It's an ecosystem. And the last point I would make is it's harder than it looks. Again, to use the Buffett example, Buffett, sort of talks in common sense ways about investing and, and people follow that, but there aren't many people who can actually replicate it. So yeah. private equity, there's great deal stories, there's great returns, but replicating it is difficult, which really, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I think the, the the points are well taken. I just want to just follow up on that a couple of things. So because a lot of families typically think, you know, if I have a billion, two, three, four, five billion dollars, I could just hire a whole bunch of people, go off and do deals. And then why do I need the likes of TPG to partner with, right? And so some of the points you made are why 
you know, without that ecosystem, without that, but what else are they missing? And what other common mistakes might people make when they go out and they kind of build out their team and then kind of jump into the fray, thinking that they have their own ecosystem that they could work with? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm a huge fan of, of family and offices, and I've advised a lot of them over the years. So um, uh, I, I've seen people do it well, but um, a, a few of the difficulties that show up. And so the analogy I would give you, Mo, is um, let's say you're going to a restaurant and you're loving that restaurant, right? It's It's been good. So think of private equity like a restaurant. We're, we're delivering food returns that you like. A lot of people will come up and say, you know what? I like this restaurant. I'd like to have my own restaurant. <laughs> and uh, if any of you have ever invested in a restaurant, you know that most restaurants fail. Yeah. And um, it's a lot to investing in a restaurant. And, uh, you know, so you have to make sure you're willing to make that commitment. And you have to understand that you never hear much about the restaurants that fail. Right. And then there's either another, you know, some people say, you know, I like this dish so much. I want to have a private chef. But if you really want that quality of dish, you're going to have to give that private chef, you got to build him a kitchen, him or her a kitchen. You got to like make sure you move to where there's great ingredients because all the things that it takes to, to create a great thing in a restaurant, it's yeah. harder than, than people think. Yeah. So I think if families are going to go from essentially um, uh, participating in the private equity industry to actually running a restaurant, Right. They have to understand um, the commitment that that entails. And the people who make that commitment uh, will uh, will do well. And if, if you don't, and frankly, the chefs will never tell you that the restaurants are hard to do. So if, yeah. you, if you hire people to do deals, they will do deals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they will do deals. And the question is, you won't know for a long time in our business unless you've hired the right people and whether you've built it. So first of all, it's harder than it looks. The second point is the reason that I moved from the Bass family to an institutional setting, I wish I could have stayed with the family, is today the scale of the industry means that you have to cover a lot of ground or you have to be very specific. The industry has basically gone into a barbell structure. Either mm -hmm. you're broadly canvassing or you have to be very specific in a point product. And so I think as family offices come in, if you're coming in with a billion dollars to do generalist private equity, um, I, I think that's a hard place to enter the market. But yeah. if you have a specific type of network and a specific strategy in an area that you feel you're, you've built your ecosystem, I think that can work. Mm -hmm. So uh, my advice for families is have a strategy in private equity. You can use Firms like ours is your channel. You can partner with them. We love to do that. You can build something that's specific, but uh, you know, not being you. You would at any of your businesses, you would require a very specific strategy. Make sure you have it for private equity. Yeah, and, and by the way, last time we spoke, you actually gave an, another analogy which I quite like that resonated with me. The difference between a private equity practitioner and an entrepreneur that's now getting into private equity. You remember the uh, the football announcer analogy you gave me? I couldn't yeah. quite repeat it. How, how would well, you identify that? How would you articulate that nuance? There's um there's a couple of surprises when you actually get in the market. So um, when you study private equity um, or you begin to do it, there's a tons of consultants. Uh, there's you know bankers. There's there's people that will tell you about it. Um, but I often find myself thinking that the people that will tell you about it have actually never played the game. So I, th I think a, when you listen to a football game, it's great when you have a professional announcer and you have someone who's actually been on the field. Right. So um, make, making sure you talk to practitioners about how private equity works as you're, uh, as you're considering it. Um, yeah. And for entrepreneurs who are moving into private equity, uh, there is... Fundamentally, you know, I hire CEOs and I hire investors, and and those two journeys, Mo, have been two of the biggest surprises in my career because it's very different than I thought. Um, I find entrepreneurs are often successful because they have a wiring that I often refer to as taking the hill. Like they 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 will find a task and they will take it. Right. Um, private equity and investors have a different skill set, which is which hill to take. And what you find is most investors are not very good managers because they're always kind of figuring out which hill to take and they don't commit to taking a hill. But also most entrepreneurs are not very good investors because when they see the hill, 
they're going to go take it without yeah. asking whether it's exactly the right hill to take. So it's been surprising to me how few investors are actually good managers and how few managers actually turn out to be successful investors. So if, if you're an entrepreneur wanting to go into private equity, respect the skill sets that are necessary to do it, just as I think private equity investors have to respect the skill sets of entrepreneurs who have built great family businesses. I love that distinction. And that analogy is, is uh, totally spot on. I, um, I wanted to come back to another point you made earlier, which is that private equity just has more toolkits than public market. Um, historically, leverage was kind of like the primary tool in the private equity toolkit. So two quick questions on the number one, to what extent is that still true? And what does, and if that is true to some extent, what does that mean given this higher cost of capital environment? And more specifically, you know, what are the more critical, most critical tools that you employ today if for whatever reason leverage is not uh, kind of the, the, the main game? Yeah, it's one of the things that drives me crazy about the industry, Mo, is that the way people talk about private equity and the way I experience it as a practitioner are very different. And um, in part, it's because private equity unfolds over a long period of time, and therefore it takes a while for people to understand what's really happening in the industry. Right. So uh, two of the things that really uh, are misunderstood about private equity is the idea of leverage buyouts as kind of a almost used as a proxy for, for mm -hmm. private equity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is people talk about it as Wall Street. Like, um, so let's touch on the second. Like, there's 3,500 private equity firms. Not all of them are in New York, and the idea of this being a Wall Street transaction-centric business is very dated. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, when I started in the business in the 90s, there were maybe 20 people in the world who really knew how to do a buyout and could lead it. Uh, today, I could give my 26-year-old son three numbers, and he could put together a buyout for a, a $3 billion company. Like it, it's just not that hard anymore. It's, it's yeah. um, uh, so the idea of it, this being a transaction driven business is I think a bit dated and the idea of how leverage is used when people um, think about private equity, they often go back to the book barbarians, the gate, which yeah. is, you know, 1989 set in conference rooms in New York, buying a you know cookie company to basically using leverage um, that's like the Dead Sea Scrolls of private equity. Like that was a way that I haven't seen it it uh, practiced in a long, long time. So um, when I started in the industry, we used to use like nine to one um, leverage ratios. Today, if you look across the TPG portfolio, we're not, our leverage ratios don't look that different than the S&P 500. Hmm. Because what's happened is the market has gotten more leverage and actually private equity has gotten less leverage very little of our returns come from leverage today. We come from growth, from changing margins, from actually changing the business. So right. leverage is a tool, but it's like the hammer that sits in your toolbox. It's there, but you don't use it as much as when you have a series of power tools on, on the side. Yeah. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, we're no longer in the leverage buyout business. Uh, we're in the governance business. We're in the growth business. Um, and we're uh, using the right tool for the right opportunity. Hmm. And and be, besides leverage, and I think that that probably is true for um, most of the most sophisticated um, sponsors uh, today, um, most of, I guess, your peers. Uh, but could you talk a little bit about how else the industry has evolved and shaped and over the last um, number of years you've been in it, and maybe even if there's any drastic changes that you're seeing in the relationship, not just in the industry writ large, but even the relationship or interaction between LPs and GPs, if there's anything interesting that you're seeing there. It's a really good question, and, and I think, Mo, an understudied question. Uh, when I grew up, my father used to communicate with me by, by leaving sayings around the house, like, uh, uh, you know, you, you do better giving your children a habit of industry than a pile of money. Um, or but one of his sayings was, um, a cobbler's children have no shoes. And I had to think about that one. But uh, that 
is often you don't take care of the things closest to you. Mm -hmm. In the private equity industry, we study every other industry, <laughs> but we often don't study our own as deeply as we might. And it's mm -hmm. been one of the most fascinating industries of the last 30 years as an industry itself. But there's a, a few trends. Um, first of all, the size of it is uh, has massively surprised. For 30 years, people have been telling us there's too much money in private equity. And yet the returns continue and the market keeps growing. I got into the business when it was a $50 billion industry. It's a $9 trillion industry now. And it, when it was 50 billion, people told me there was too much money in private equity. So what have we missed? We've missed the fact that what private equity really is, is a better way of investing for certain companies. And it's picking sh up share. Um, in 1995, there were 9,600 public companies in the US. There's now like 4,800. The mm. public market is getting smaller and larger and older. In 1995, the average company in the public market was 12 years old. Now it's 18 years old. And so the public market is where you go you know, buy Apple. But right. the youngest, most interesting companies in the world increasingly are in the private market. And so today there's probably 17,000 companies in private equity portfolios in the U.S. versus 4,600 public stocks. There's 3,500 private equity funds. So the, the, you have to think of the market as, as a market. So yeah. trend number one is, is continuing to grow and continuing to get more complex. Right. Second trend I would point out is the movement from the general to the specific. In the early days of private equity, as I said, it was like, could you do a buyout? And the funds were all generalist funds. Today, the market has gone into a series of generalist funds and a series of specific funds. And that, Mo, you and I talked about this a little bit. In the early days of, of mutual funds, people invested in Magellan. It was one big fund. And now there's hundreds of small funds that allow you to, uh, to pick your own portfolio. Right. Third trend would be the LPs are getting a lot more sophisticated, which is driving some of the sophistication in the market. So um, when I used to visit people in the 90s, Mo, I had to explain what private equity was. I'm not explaining to anybody on this phone that, that it's mm -hmm. something to think about in your portfolio. Right. Um, but as the LPs have gotten more sophisticated, they don't want to just give all their money to me and I put it where I want to do it. They want to choose which of our sectors, which of our products. And that's a good thing on mm -hmm. both sides. So the market is maturing and it's barbelling. As I said before, there's point products and then there's platforms. Right. Um, and the last point is, you're right, the, the basis of relationships are changing and they're going from transactional to relationship. And what, what I mean by that is it used to be like, do you want to buy this fund? And I'll show up four years from now and see if you want to buy it again. Now, and this is a real opportunity for, I think, the family investors on the fund. Now there's co-invest, there's sharing, there's co-underwriting together. There's the ability to kind of partner in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very positive thing. So it's uh, when you enter the private equity market, um, it's a little bit to, for me, like uh, we, we do some investing out here. I'm in Los Angeles today in Los Angeles. And if you've ever been to a movie set, like when you watch a movie, it's one thing. But when you see it being made, it's something different. Mm -hmm. When you come to private equity, don't just watch the movie. Like really understand how it's being made and, and how you, do you want to be an executive producer? Do you want to be in front of the camera? Like where... Where do you sit in that? Because the the finished product can be pretty slick, but making it is is pretty complicated. Yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. I, I want to pick up on something you said earlier. Where you said effectively that the number of public markets companies have halved or shrunk significantly, <laughs> and the number of private equity companies have expanded. Um, I'm curious, like, how has the value proposition changed? Or, or in other words, when are public markets a better platform, and vice versa? Um, given what's happened in public markets, which is a huge expense of being a public company, uh, public markets are probably better when you get to a certain size uh, or where there's enough volatility in the business that investors want to be able to get in and out quickly. Mm. So the, the, the one advantage of the public markets is speed to liquidity. 
most of the other advantages sit with the private markets. Right, right. That's and right. so where would you want to have speed to liquidity? A really big company because, you you know, I'd hate to try to like create a deal to buy Apple to exit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's situations that are volatile, like, a, you know, a young software company that, that uh, et cetera. But more and more, here, here's a, well, if you think about asset classes, uh, a lot of families have real estate. Real estate lives in the private market for generations. And 90% mm -hmm. of the real estate business probably sits in private markets, 10% in publics. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, corporate has been the opposite, where everything, you know, everyone wanted to get to the public markets. And what's happened over time is there's a realization that some companies should just stay private forever, just like some yeah. buildings should be owned privately forever. Why, why go to the public markets? Mm, interesting. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And so when you actually look across other private markets, and we've been talking a lot about private equity, but when you actually look at real estate or private credit, um, where do you see the most growth or most innovation happening in other parts of private markets besides direct what was historically buyouts? Yeah. Um, where are the extensions? Yeah, let, let me split real estate from corporate for a second. Let me stick with corporate sure. and then I'll jump over to real estate. So one of the, the most fascinating parts of this cobbler has no shoes um, phenomena within uh, private equity is um, the private equity business has actually spawned a series of businesses themselves. And mm. those businesses have become hugely important. So coming out of the global financial crisis, the private equity industry was still going a lot of interesting things to do but the banking market was was frozen up and as a result there was the growth of the private credit market and the mm -hmm. private credit market which has now expanded to become a multi-trillion dollar market was largely lending to mid-market private equity firms who couldn't get capital elsewhere and right. from the beginning it's now become a very interesting part of the market and recently with the regional bank crisis in the u.s it's popped up again at this time that banks are are struggling with, with various um, uh, challenges, the private credit market going forward has become a important piece of uh, investors' portfolio. The way I think about private credit is just as if, as private equity had, is like public markets with a better toolkit, mm -hmm. private credit is credit markets with a better toolkit. Then the bond market, presumably, then the, the bond market, then banks, et cetera. They, right. you know, okay. and, and once bonds get traded everywhere, like who's in charge of, of working with the covenants, et cetera, banks right. have regulators all over. So it's just right. a different way to express that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's come out of the private equity market are the secondary markets, of which there's two. Uh, the secondary market really started in the 2000 period after the tech bubble and then accelerated after the global financial crisis. And it allows LPs to get liquidity in their portfolio. Right. And that's a really important development, you know, because one of the questions people always have in private equity is what should my illiquidity premium be? And I was sitting with a CIO of a mid-sized plan recently. And she said like, should I get 500 basis points more liquid? You know what? And I asked her, how big is your private equity portfolio since $3 billion? And I said, I'll get you a bid for it by tomorrow. Yeah. So the idea of private equity being illiquid is no longer true with the secondary market. You may not like the pricing. It may take harder. You can't you know, do it over a Quotron, but you can get liquidity in private equity because of the secondary market. And then the, the big development, which people have not quite gotten their, their head around, but I would I would make sure you're focusing on is there's a new thing called GP secondaries. And that is just as the LP secondaries were a tool to manage your portfolio as an LP, GP secondaries is capital that partners with GPs who want to hold their best assets longer or who mm -hmm. want to manage their funds to allow fundraising by increasing um, payouts. Mm -hmm. And so this is a new tool. It's, it's very quickly growing. And I think it's one of the most interesting parts of the market. So as you're watching the private equity market go, and we should, we should talk about where the market is today, like yeah, watching yeah, the yeah. tools along the side. Real estate is fascinating right now because when you say real estate, you usually think of it, Mo, as an asset class. Um, there is a, uh, there's some really interesting things, but it's almost like the herd's been cut 
and like the office market is often a different place. Right. And like uh, you know, logistics, data centers, they're like running one way and mm -hmm. offices are running the other. And how that's going to work out is one of the great questions in business. Hmm. And so let's let's actually delve into, I mean, you've alluded to the fact that we, we do want to talk about like what are the best and most exciting ideas that are uh, of interest to you guys today. So when you're thinking about it, it doesn't matter which strategy, doesn't matter what asset classes we're talking about. We'd love to hear which you're most focused on. And, and also just generally, how do you develop conviction around your best ideas? How, how do you uh, think about them and how do you implement them? Yeah, well, step back and talk a little bit about where the market is today, because that tells us a little bit about where we're, we're looking and developing conviction. One of the important things to understand about private equity, this is something I, I said years ago to our, our LPs, and it's often repeated, like when it feels bad, it's good. And when it feels good, it's bad. So, um, you know, one of the things about private equity is when the markets are running and everyone is happy, you know, that's usually when you get in trouble. And it's when things seize up a little bit, as we're seeing now, this, this is actually the interesting time in private equity. Right. Um, and one of the things that I would say to your clients is um, private equity has a momentum aspect to it. And, and the way that plays is when returns are really strong, people run to private equity and then they put in a bunch of money that is probably deployed at the wrong time. So um, people who drive their private equity tanker by like spinning the wheel, like I'm going to run here, I'm going to run there, almost always get in trouble. Mm -hmm. What you want to do with private equity is, is find a steady and, and sort of stay with it because mm -hmm. when things feel a little rough is exactly when you want to deploy. Right. And when things are very happy, it's a time to, to be careful. And so that that um, that aspect of understanding that when you're trying to figure out what's going on in the market, that's the time to figure out what's going on in the market. And and we're in one of those those moments right now. So for, what are you most excited about in that in that market? Yeah, uh, I'm interested in solving problems today. So one of the things that is endemic of TPG is we approach investing as problem solving. In other words, if you can find a way where your capital is addressing a societal issue, a, a transactional issue. We um, started our firm, our first investment was the largest bankruptcy in US history at the time, Continental Airlines in the worst industry. It was awful, mm -hmm. people thought we were nuts, right? And it turned into a, a very, very successful deal because yeah. we were solving a problem in a way that that made sense. So as, as I look at the marketplace today, you know, there's two ideas that I'm looking for. Um, one is where is the wind at our back? And the second is where are there problems to be solved? Mm -hmm. Why are those the two important questions? We're coming off a decade where the wind was at your back everywhere. Interest rates were down, the economy was up, geopolitics were pretty uh, mundane. Like, it, you know, this was a sunny period. We yeah. then, and, and the way I think about it is, um, you know, everyone today is talking about the landing. Is it a hard landing? Is it a soft landing? It's not about the landing. It's about where you take off and where you land. Still on it. And and the so this idea of, you know, where we took off from was a particularly benign connection. Uh, excuse me, is particularly benign set of of uh, moments, and then we went into a very bumpy flight, COVID, right. you know, world events. We're now landing in a brand new world mm -hmm. and um in that world assets that all move together are, are dispersing you know we're going from globalism to regionalism uh we're going from low interest rates to inflation like there's a bunch of things changing so sure. in that environment don't focus so much on the landing focus on where you are when the plane opens the door mm. and uh what we're looking for are sectors that have momentum because we know it's not going to be sunny skies for everyone. And we're looking for specific problems to solve. So let me give you an example of a, of a problem to solve. Um, there was a ton of momentum in growth equity. And we today have, last number I saw was like 1,200 unicorns. 
uh, unicorns yeah. were a topic that came up, you know, this month, like 2015. And they were so rare, like there was none of them. So they called them unicorns. There's not, we now have herds of unicorns. Um, at the same, well, capital is drying up for them. Now, in those 1,200 unicorns, there are probably 500 of the best opportunities you're going to see in your investment career. You just have to figure out which ones. So sorting out those issues, just like after the tech bubble, that's when Facebook was founded, when Google was founded, when Amazon took off. So it's moments like this. If we can sort through that, that's a huge opportunity for mm -hmm. uh, investors. Uh, sorting through the real estate debt market, like because there's going to be a lot of over levered. We, we, you know, we, we just started a product to, to do exactly that because it's, it's incredibly important. So find problems and then find areas where they, there's also momentum. So obviously there's going to be a huge amount of spending across AI. I won't go there today, but, but that has momentum. You have to have an opinion. An area that intersects a problem and momentum is climate. Mm -hmm. There's an area that government stimulus is coming in. We're in the midst of a transition. We can argue how fast it's going to happen. We can argue exactly how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And so how do you uh, how do you address that? Yeah, and I'd love to dig into that a little bit because uh, clearly you've shown your commitment to the climate arena. I mean, you've actually shifted your role to lead this effort at TPG and you've then, you know, a number of years ago proceeded to raise the largest fund in this space. I think it was one of the early large funds in the space. Um, could you talk a little bit about how it, it is a wave? How do you see the climate wave different than the technology wave that you talked about, right? So the evolution of whether it was the dot coms or robotics or AI or whatever else, how do you see climate as being different or similar to those? Yes, yeah, so first of all, you're right. You, you should think of it as a wave. And the reason that I've been as focused on it, Mo, as, as I have been is thinking back over my career, there's only been a few waves and how you set yourselves up for them. So I would argue interest rates going from 15 to three or zero, like that was a wave. That's a good time to be buying levered equities. That's the private equity industry. Mm -hmm. Like uh, globalization, you know, not only created the ability to invest in Asia, but also took margins around the world up 500 basis points. Sure. Technology, it affected everything. Um, but what we learned in those waves is that the people who set up specialized capital and efforts to do them outperformed and got a larger share of the profits. So as you think about the climate wave, we as investors have to find specialized ways to build the knowledge base and have the right capital to deploy into it. So the reason I jumped into climate the way we have is uh, I promised myself, having watched the tech wave, that if another of these came up, we would be all in. Hmm. And, and that's uh, that's really the genesis of, of what we're doing. Now, there is... Um, that's the similarity is that you got to position yourself for the wave. Uh, the difference is this wave capital is much more important. Um, and that's actually good for investors because, you know, unless you were, uh, uh, you know, unless you were a scientist sitting in, in Silicon Valley, it was harder to play the early parts of the, of the tech wave, you know, now mm -hmm. um, I think you can understand what's going to happen with EVs or, or other, other areas. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think you have to set it up differently. And um, uh, it's it's going to happen on a global basis. So you have to kind of approach it with a global mindset. Could you just elaborate a little bit on why capital is much more critical? Well, uh, the um, this is a physical uh, uh, revolution, Mo. Um, and in the internet, bits and bytes First of all, when you we have a software idea, someone gives you the internet for free. Like you can just like roll it out, right? It, it's it's one of the greatest. Why has so much wealth been created? Because it didn't take much capital to create wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be more like the industrial revolution, more like the oil and gas revolution, et cetera, where those with capital will uh, mm -hmm. create mm -hmm. the physical solutions. So the you know the average um, 
uh, technology company of the large ones traded at 20 times book, which tells you that that the capital isn't the important part. The average kind of major industrial or oil and gas company trades at three or four times book, which tells you that capital is critical. Yeah. And the other reason that one should focus on this area, and again, um, if you're a climate denier or you're a climate you know, evangelist, um, what you should understand is that it looks like $120 trillion is going to be spent on this. And that $120 trillion will not come unless there's also $120 trillion of profit. So mm -hmm. think of this as one of the largest potential profit pools of the next, maybe ever, but also certainly of the next 15 years. So you have to have an opinion on how to do this. So sectors like this, you know, climate is a change. The tech world is a change. Online education is an area we're active in coming out of COVID. We have a mm -hmm. step function change in, in educational tools. Uh, so find change, find problems to solve. That's going to be what drives this era. So can we come back to a comment you just made? There's going to be $120 trillion of capital. It's got to be $120 trillion of returns. Do you talk two points I'd love to just dig into? One is uh, historically, there have been a lot of investors in the climate arena that have been more concessionary type or expecting concessionary type returns. In other words, they were doing it for the good of the climate, for the world of the environment and so on and so forth. Do you see that evolving? And then also just how do we be cautious about the hype? I mean, in every one of these um, phases and every one of these waves and stages, there's been lots of entrants, fewer survivors, or it's hard to kind of separate yeah. the wheat from the chaff. How, how do you think about that? Well, that's why you need the specialized efforts, right? Because it's not just the upside of being in the middle of it. It's the it's the risk mitigant of knowing what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, uh, the most important thing I do is say no. So let, let me give you an example of, of the hype and also why you want to do this in the private market. If you want to invest in climate solutions today, you are going to be overweighted in EVs, batteries, mm -hmm. and renewables. So 95% of what's available to you in the public market is EVs, batteries, and renewables, which are only about 30% of the climate marketplace. Right. The other 70% is all in the private. So I'm pretty bearish on EVs. Hmm. And the reason for that is, is uh, I think there's going to, you know, it's going to happen much faster than we think. But if you go back and study history, uh, in 1925, there were over 150 car companies in Detroit. Three survived. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if you pick the right three, you did great. But, you know, right now there's 57 OEMs with 371 models. I can't hmm. tell you who's going to win. But I can tell you, you're about to see one of the biggest death struggles you've ever seen because no one can lose. So um, we're, we're going to watch Detroit 1925. I want to sell picks and shovels to that war. I don't necessarily want to buy EVs. The, the second area is batteries. Like um, when we, we started looking at climate, I, I thought batteries was going to be an interesting area. We are now very cautious on batteries. And the reason is when you meet your first six battery companies, um, sounds interesting. We're on now 50 battery companies hmm. and, and they all think they're dealing with the same OEMs. They're all trying to get the same raw materials and they all think they're going to make 30% return selling to OEMs, which has never happened in the history of, of mankind. So I, I think there's a chance that batteries are like disk drives in the early days of the tech boom. Mo, everyone thought disk drives were the best investment. There was a hundred disk drive companies. Again, three survived. Right. And so th these markets are going to happen, but it doesn't mean you want to invest in. And that's where, where people like us come in. And the, to your first point, the, um, the climate marketplace did itself a massive disservice by coming in asking for concessionary capital. Hmm. You know, we're the opposite, which is it has to have market returns or better. Why? We need scale solutions. We got to bring 120 trillion of ca capital coming in. The capital is not coming unless the returns mm -hmm. are high. And, and that's why you see governments acting to help bring the capital in. So it's not that concessionary investing is self-defeating. 
because the companies that you're creating, if they don't deliver market returns, they can't scale. So we we right. uh, basically say the the right way to um, to deal with this is to demand market returns are better, mm -hmm. because that's the way you sort for solutions that will scale. And, and how you know you you just mentioned that the governments have been behind this. I mean, obviously we we've, we've let's start with the Paris Accord and what have you. Uh, what have you seen a shift in other parties coming to the table? Have you seen like what um, tailwinds are you seeing, and perhaps what headwinds might affect the momentum that we're now seeing in climate? So I guess two part, uh, yeah. diametrically opposed question. So first of all, this is something I've been watching a long time, Mo. In, in 1978, in high school, I had to do like some, uh, you know, Congress, you know, student Congress thing. And my my paper was tax credits for rooftop solar. Like in 1978, we were talking about this. But there was not that much to do for a long period of time. Um, the governments got there first. So the governments, we had 196 company, countries that, that, that made net zero pledges before we had a single company. Yeah. But the reason that we're getting the momentum that we're getting today and the reason it's happening now is that those tailwinds you talked about have all lined up. And let me sort of very quickly run through it. First of all, um, governments are behind it. They're putting in stimulus. The stimulus is appropriate. Look at how much money we put into the oil and gas business, into the drug business, into the real estate business. Like we we as countries support industries that are important. This is an important, that the subsidies have gone in the oil and gas business dwarf what we're doing for climate, right? So so the, this, is, this is getting the flywheel moving. Governments are behind it. We now have like 3,000 companies that are making net zero pledges. We have climate consumerism, the, the Greta effect. We have the Larry Fink effect, which is capital is now asking the question. Mm -hmm. And then what people have missed is solar, EVs, all the technologies are moving down the supply curve much faster than people thought. Mm -hmm. The new adoption curves for EVs and solar are like 80% higher than where they were three years ago. Like it's moving much faster than people think because the prices are coming down. And then you add on top of that two very important things of the past couple of years. First of all, you add the Ukraine. And the Ukraine has created a important uh, understanding of the need for energy security. In the US and Canada, we have energy security, <coughs> but if you look at India and Europe, the only way they can have energy security is to go green. Mm -hmm. And so this has accelerated the mm -hmm. idea of going green. Um, it's not just about emissions anymore, it's about security yeah. also. And finally, I was watching TV today, the, the ocean off Florida is 101 degrees. Like we're, we're watching, we're watching you know, this idea of momentum. So the tailwinds are largely um, are largely intact. In fact, it's hard to find a sector with as powerful a tailwinds. The headwinds are that this is very complicated. Mm -hmm. It's knowledge specific and the market is not well formed up on it. And what I mean by that is there's 194 funds greater than a billion dollars that'll do tech investing. There's a couple of handfuls doing climate. And uh, we need to increase the capital is going to be the feedstock of this revolution, Mo. And we've got to like hook up the pipes. Hmm. Interesting. And and like, I mean, you, you mentioned one hundred and twenty trillion dollars, if I understood correctly. Um, you know, is that is that the size of this opportunity? And and to what extent do you envision that one hundred and twenty trillion dollars actually showing up? And where is that coming from? Yeah. Um, so first of all, 120 is, I think, a McKinsey number. And the answer is who knows, but it's big, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, but we don't have to look at that's between now and 2040, I think. But but if you you don't have to look that far in advance this year. Spending on green solutions past fossil fuel. Uh, solution and solutions, and it's going to be six point five trillion dollars a year by 2026. So it's happening right in front of us right now. Yeah. And um, 
I think the capital will show up, but it will only show up if there's profit attached to it. Yeah. And that's why I say, you know, we're all focused on, wow, that's a lot of capital and this is a risk. We have to, we have to basically, um, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes is F. Scott Fitzgerald, who said the, the, the uh, sign of first rate intelligence is the ability to keep two opposing ideas in your mind and still function. So there's two opposing ideas here. This is hard, it's risk, it's et cetera. Let me give you another one. This is a huge opportunity. If you solve this problem, it's a huge opportunity. Sure. So we have to keep both of those things in mind. It's hard, right. it's risk. You know, there's, there's a risk to society, but if we solve it, it's for investors, it's a really interesting area. And you know, you've partnered, I'm mean, particularly in the Rise Fund and uh, some of the related initiatives, you partnered with Bono and Hank Paulson on this. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what led you to partner with them and what have you learned from them as part of this process? So uh, when we, for your clients who aren't familiar with it, um, back in 2015, we started this question of why, you know, I, I said we like to solve problems, why did impact investing never scaled? And um, in doing that, we took this learning that I mentioned before, which is private equity is not just an individual. It's not just a firm. It's creating an ecosystem, right? Um, and uh, you know, Bono is someone with Red and One who's created an ecosystem successfully in Africa that that combined purpose and business in a really unique way. And so we brought him into our ecosystem to help us understand the learnings from that. Um, as we built into the climate area, climate is clearly going to be at the intersection of government, business, and policy. And if you think about the warriors who have successfully done that, Hank Paulson lived at the, you know, when, when we had a different type of crisis, you know, he was someone who understood how those pieces could come together to solve it. And so bringing them into our ecosystem is this understanding that if you're going to solve big problems, you have to create, you know, like to have good friends. And so, uh, you know, our investor, but we were also joined in our climate fund by 28 of the largest corporations in the world. From Google to Apple to Nike to Boeing to GM to G, who basically are trying to create their own climate solutions and are looking to be part of our ecosystem to do that. So it's it it, it you know then raising a child it takes a village and hmm. building a private equity solution it takes an ecosystem. Yeah, I know, and it seems like you found the right partners. I mean, just very quickly, you know, I remember a short story when as a number of years ago uh, at Davos and. Right after David Rubenstein from Carlisle finished speaking, I went over to him to just uh, say hello, uh, catch up. And we had a whole swath of people around us that gathered to talk to David after I was done. And all of a sudden, Bono walked into the room and I looked around and nobody was standing with me and David. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, <laughs> you picked the uh -huh. right partners. Um, maybe I know we have time for maybe just one last uh a question. This has been absolutely fascinating. And Jim, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, you know, what, when you look out into the world, perhaps beyond climate, beyond private equity, when you kind of look at the macro regime, what are the things that are uh, keeping you up at night? What are the things that uh, you're most excited about other than the things we've talked about? And um, and if you had to look into your crystal ball, what what, what do you see number of you know five ten years out that uh, we should be thinking about today yeah i think um uh well that's a bit that's a big question um <laughs> for the last question of the day <laughs> what's um things things on my mind uh two mantras that i've been repeating to our organization i'll bring it down to that one is uh, and not or and mm -hmm. the second is um show not tell mm. and so and not or is uh, we live in a world that whether accelerated by social media or how politics is playing out, people are running to their corner. And uh, I think you can be progressive and fiscally responsible. I think you can be conservative and compassionate. You can invest in climate and have good returns. Right. We, it's not one of the, like that's the whole thing with concessionary. It's the wrong question because you, it's, it's self-defeating. So we're, we're going to drive investing that solves problems and delivers great returns because the two play on each other in a way. Right, so right. generally, whenever people try to take us apart, like, you know, take 
take climate people like we can't solve the grid the grid's complicated you know i whenever i get worried about the grid um i go back to my hotel room i, I hook into wi-fi like what the hell's that and i watch netflix like 15 years ago we were we were sending discs right and now now we can watch every movie in the world in 15 so we can't solve the grid in 30 years like right. we, we can do these things right so we got to be worried and we have to take action and the last point i think is um you know show not tell there's mm -hmm. a lot of talk about these things like one of the things in the tech world or the climate world there's you know there's a there's echo chambers going on of all sorts you know we our job at TPG and what I hope a lot of the families on the phone are doing here is we got to be practical pragmatists. We got to go do the work. Right. And when I'm out meeting with entrepreneurs around the world on these problems, you get a sense of optimism mm -hmm. because you understand we, you know, operation warp speed, we had a vaccine in, in six months that was going to take four years. When we get to work, we can put people on the moon in 10 years when people said it couldn't be done in 30. When we get to work, things happening. So let's, let's, you know, not talk about it. Let's go do it. And, you know, let's put together and rather than argue over or. That was Jim. That was fabulous. What a great way to end it. Thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your insights and being so generous with your time. We really do appreciate it and hope we could do it again soon. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, man.